uh, following the unprecedented disruption caused by COVID-19 at all levels of football, FIFA has worked on a series of recommendations and guidelines uh, to address some of the key practical issues arising from the pandemic, especially with regards to uh, player contracts and the transfer system generally. And this has been done in consultation with different stakeholders through uh, a, a task force which also includes representatives of clubs, players, uh, leagues, national associations and confederations. Now a set of principles has been unanimously agreed by the task force and was endorsed by the Bureau of the FIFA Council. Now Steve, take us through what these principles are and uh, how we believe it will work out. Well, the principle you are speaking about um, started on the 18th of March mm. 2020. That was when FIFA constituted a working group um, in consultation with of stakeholders and industry um, representatives of the confederations mm. in various, of various continents. So um, they now came up with guidelines, guidelines basically seeking to uh, give a policy direction in respect on some key issues arising yeah. from the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic. Uh, one of such issues is the issue of the transfer system. You know, the transfer window opens uh, at the end of every of the season. season yeah. uh, the second one is uh, with regards to employment agreements mm -hmm. and then player contracts. So FIFA came out uh, and made some proposals. It calls it a guideline that would um, show uh, a path that the football stakeholders will take in the coming months as we, uh, of course, pray that this whole pandemic mm -hmm. uh, goes away. So um, the first one was on player contracts. Okay. You know, normally, player contracts end by June 30th mm -hmm. of every season. So for players who will be running out of contracts at the end of the season, mm. it was imperative because of the uncertainty surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. No yeah. one knows when football will be live Resume, yeah. on our screen again. So mm -hmm. it was important to give a policy direction as to what happens to such contracts. So FIFA now came and said, oh, that the contracts will now end by the time this season actually ends. ends. So it becomes a bit of a problem because I don't know whether the players' unions were consulted when this decision was taken. Was taken. Uh, because as you will see, there, there are legal implications, mm -hmm. especially with regards to employment contracts in sports. Yeah. So FIFA now came up and said, okay, that those contracts will now end when the season ends. Mm. The second one was on employment agreements. Basically, employment agreements that have become impossible to f perform as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. So FIFA came up and also threw that up in the air and said that uh, the employment agreements would um, be revised in accordance with certain guidelines that would direct the path for both clubs and the players. Mm. So essentially, what we are seeing is that the employment agreements, where it becomes impossible for the clubs to perform their contractual obligations, mm. paying salaries, bonuses, and all that, FIFA established key principles, key factors that it will consider in the event of a disagreement between the club and the player. player. One of those is uh, whether there was any attempt at mutual agreement. Mm -hmm. So basically what FIFA did was to urge all the stakeholders to uh, try amicably to settle the issues arising from the employment agreements. Yeah. So the second one was whether the, the proportionality of the amendment made to the contracts. Mm -hmm. The third one was the quality of the contracts. In other words, does the amendment go ac apply across board to all the players? Mm. So, of course, you have some uh, players like Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. So, what FIFA is trying to do is to make sure there are no sacred cows. Mm. So, if you are going to apply a wage cut, for example, it's going to be done across board. Mm. Uh, you saw what happened to Juventus. They've done wage deferral. Wage deferral simply means that they will still end their wages but at a later date. Okay. So uh, that is part of the uh, guideline that FIFA came up with. So among other factors. So the third one, lastly, um, is on transfer window. Transfer window, like I say, I said before, ends at the end of every season. So what FIFA has done now is to extend the transfer window such that the transfer window will now officially open. Usually it officially opens on July 1 of every mm -hmm. year. So 
Well, FIFA has now extended it. No one knows the actual date until yeah. this season ends. The Dutch Eredivisie, Divisie, as you will recall, just last night, uh, terminated the uh, Dutch League. No winner, no relegation. No, winner, no relegation. Mm. So uh, it, it's an unfolding drama before us. So mm. these, 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 in a nutshell, are the guidelines FIFA has set for. So we're looking at the legal implications. So what we wonder, what are the legal implications of uh, such issues? Mm. The first one is, uh, there seems to be some kind of unilateral extension of these players' contracts. Okay. Now, the position in English law, which incidentally is also the position here in, in Nigeria as a common law country, okay. is that a party cannot unilaterally extend the contract of a player, a player. without con due consultation. Now, if you are extending these contracts without unilaterally informing the players, but what are the legal implications for the player? What are the options available to the player? Now, the position of the law is that there are three options open to players whose contracts have been laterally extended mm -hmm. or, or terminated, as the case may be. The, one of the options is, first of all, the, the player might just decide to uh, resign immediately and mm -hmm. allege what we call a repudiatory breach of contract. Uh, alternatively, the player can resign and sue for constructive dismissal. Now, in any of these two options, the player will be um, entitled to damages. The second option is what you call the stand and sue approach. Mm. The player can remain in the employment, collect whatever, that is in the event that a wage court has been unilaterally imposed yeah. by such clubs. Because FIFA is also looking at the financial clout of the clubs who mm. have been are negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. So FIFA is now looking at it, now saying, okay, uh, that these, these clubs can unilaterally uh, reduce the wages of these players. What happens in practice is that they engage the players for places where you have strong player unions, like the PFA in England, mm. they would engage the PFA. But where they don't engage the PFA, like what Arsenal did, they can engage the players. Now, there are a number of issues. Uh, like I said, the first option is to sue for uh, constructive dismissal, dismissal or resign and sue for a, a breach of contract. The second option is to remain in the contract, accept whatever wage court has mm -hmm. been imposed, and then sue uh, immediately for the balance. The, wow. the third option is to uh, the, what you call the sit down look approach in mm -hmm. Nigerian balance. You can just decide to uh, sit down what it simply means is that when you um, acquiesce to such development, you will no longer be able to bring an action mm. tomorrow. You look at football contracts. Um, there's, there's been a lot of talk about wage cuts in football and how it's going to work. Now FIFA has taken cognizance of that. What FIFA has done, essentially, is to um, urge the stakeholders, the players and the clubs to reach amicable settlement. Mm. And when they don't reach amicable settlement and there's a dispute, FIFA has said that the applicable law will be the national law. So the national employment law of all the, all, all the players or the nationalities of the players would come into play instead of the usual FIFA arbitration mm. clauses. So, um, that, so that in a nutshell is um, these are the uh, legal implications. An interesting point is that that guideline also, for some very funny reason, applies to coaches. Mm. Now, uh, coaches, as you know, they, there's no regulatory framework guiding the um, contracts with managers or coaches in football. What you have, the only place you have in the RSTP, because FIFA purportedly made these guidelines from the FIFA regulations on the status and transfer of players. Yeah. So, and the FIFA regulation on the status and transfer of players applies principally to only players wow. and not managers. So, it, it befuddles me how FIFA uh, would include managers in the equation because there is no regulatory framework guiding managers. The managers. The only place where managers are expressly mentioned is with regards to the jurisdiction or that is FIFA, the adjudicatory uh, powers of FIFA to adjudicate over any dispute between the managers and football clubs. Mm. So, uh, and then um, the, there's also the small matter of intermediaries. You know, usually when a contract is renewed or um, is renewed or extended, there's a commission 
that goes to the players' agents. True. So is FIFA now saying that the agents will be paid those commissions? So these, these are the unfolding drama that we are, we can't wait to see how uh, they will it's unravel mm. in the coming months. True. But well, remember, you can reach us on our phone line 0906 005719. Uh, Bidonia, you know, will be joining us uh, right now on Skype. Let's talk to her and have our own uh, view on what we've talked about so far. Good morning, Doing. Good morning, Doka. How's it been? How are you keeping safe over there? It's been fine. Um, I mean, we're staying home. We've been directed to stay home. So uh, that's, that's basically what we're doing. All right, let's talk about what we've, um, the, the, the story we have so far, talking about player contracts and uh, employment contracts uh, in football, how COVID-19 has actually affected this. What will be your take on this so far? Uh, thank you for the background that you're giving on uh, guidelines. Uh, I, I believe that that was, that was necessary anyways by, by FIFA because a lot of questions have, have come up basically on contracts that have not been able to, that have not been performed. There are some contracts that are ongoing and there are some that have not been performed and it was essential for FIFA to come up with those guidelines. They tried to address um, certain issues which uh, Mr. Steve has already pointed out. But if you look at the guidelines, um, they, they, they seem to be one-sided. They seem to be protecting the club more than they are actually protecting the players and you know, the coaches and the rest of them. Because like you, made, like you mentioned, you are keeping a player in the a unilateral extension, you, you, unilateral extension, uh, extending, excuse me, the player's contract without consulting the player as it's supposed to be. So you're basically turning the player down and you expect that you would have to, uh, you know, play by the rules without consulting it. So I believe that those guidelines are just a bit one-sided. They are only, they're only protecting the club rather than the player. But, but, but if you look at it um, from, from, a, from a fair position, a position of common interest, it, everyone knows what's going on right now. Nobody anticipated the pandemic. And maybe the club didn't anticipate any of the players. And as it, as it stands, it's, everyone should suffer a bit from, from the pandemic. So just like um, you pointed out, Juventus, the, 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 the squad, they agreed to a great deferral. Of which, like you said, they will pay the, the club, they will pay the players when they can, but they've already agreed to wait the power. I, I, I believe that that's, that's reasonable coming from those players because you can obviously see what's going on. Recently, to Arsenal released a statement that their first team squad have also agreed to a pay call about 12.5% some other costs that they've agreed to uh, for the next 12 months because, you know, just considering the, the, the clubs. Financial standing now. They're not, they're not making money from uh, ticket, day ticket. They're not making money from a, a number of things that they'll be making money from usually. So the players have agreed to a, a, a pay cut, although a, a minority of them, about three players, have not agreed to that. So looking at it generally, looking at the contracts, looking at the employment contract, uh, my take on it is, well, somebody has to give. So the player, the, the player should be willing to let go of some things just to ensure that uh, uh, peace reigns when it comes to... We are looking forward to when we'll be able to watch football again. Uh, we're going to move around. Um, it's nobody's fault. For, for instance, the Dutch government has moved their footballing activity to September 1. So the, the Dutch league, they had no other option than to just cancel the season. No, no promotion, no relegation. So it's also... It's also uh, just saying that a number of us should also be ready, willing to sacrifice. So that's that's really my take on the on the guidelines and the effects and contracts. All right. Um, let me ask you this. Um, lastly, do you think that the player should base this on sentiments, or should they stick by the law by collecting what they are owned? Or of course, should they be um, sympathetic with the whole situation on ground? Players are expected. Players are expected to be sympathetic. I believe everybody, the club should be sympathetic, the players should be sympathetic. For instance, now there are some players that um, they, they mostly give about uh, 30, 50 percent of their salary to charity. So, I mean, basically the player is only earning 50 percent. So, I, I, I believe that the club should be sympathetic, the players should also be sympathetic. And, um, 
that can only be that can only be solved when both parties come together to to come to a joint collective agreement. So the players should be consulted, the clubs should be consulted. Uh, the clubs and the players will sit down probably in the room and then discuss how the pandemic has affected each party and then they discuss the way forward. You're know, putting everybody in consideration. Just like the case uh, Mr. Steve mentioned, one of the one of the issues in that case was that the the, the employee the employee was not consulted. So the employee should also be consulted. Let's hear their take on it. Both parties should be sympathetic towards the effect that it has had on each of them. And then they, they, they find a way forward. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, Doing, I know, this morning. Thank you, Doka. You know, Steve, the reason why I asked about um, player sentiments or sticking by the rules, because, yes, you, you, you should pay them what they are being owed, in as much as we do not have any uh, footballing activity going on at the moment. Some NBA clubs, as in basketball now, they have said that they have what it takes to still to keep paying these players in as much as there are no NBA games going on. Now, case study is asked now. She rightly mentioned there were three players. They refused to mention the other two players. Mesut Ozil seems to be the scapegoat on this matter now. Ozil said he wants to see what the financial implications would be con con connecting with COVID-19. Every other player has agreed to take um, a, a pay cut. And Ozil said, no, I would, I would rather do a deferral, but let me see what's going to happen financially with this COVID-19. And it seems to be, have become a scapegoat. Must a player follow what um, the club has um, seek their opinion on, or should he stick by his own rules? Oh, okay, thank you very much. The starting point is that all these contracts were entered individually. Mm -hmm. There was no collective contract exactly. with the players. So um, it is completely, um, um, how do I put it? It's, it's completely unnecessary yeah. to now impose that uh, wage cuts on the players without due consultation. Mm -hmm. So if Ozil says I'm not accepting it, I'm not accepting it. It's as simple as that. So what he has done is making a smart move by saying, okay, I want to know the financial position of the club before mm -hmm. I'll be in a position to accept anything. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that, like I said before, the PFA is a very, very strong uh, trade union, players union mm -hmm. in England. The PFA usually would have a very strong say in these kind of things. And that is why you, you see most of the clubs uh, try to apply what you call fellow mm. of the non-playing staff. So what it simply means is that you are temporarily suspending the employment contract with the non-playing staff. So at that point, they are not going to earn any wages, they are not going to earn any salaries, no allowances, nothing. Mm. So they will be dependent on the government. So Liverpool, Tottenham, uh, told that line, but because of the backlash from the media, they had to backtrack. Yeah. So now, coming to Ozil, Ozil, like I said, signed an independent contract with the club. If he says, I'm not accepting what you're proposing, I'm not accepting it, except there's a unilateral uh, wage court clause, a, a clause that uh, entitles or empowers the club to unilaterally impose a wage court on the player. In the absence of that clause, it is completely uh, not applicable. Mm. Now, you talk about whether it will be sentimental on the part of the players. Yes, mm -hmm. I expect the players to be understanding because of the unusual situation that the, most of the clubs have found themselves. Most of these clubs depend on um, money generated from match day. There's no yeah. match going on right now. Ticket sales, merchandising and everything. So where do you expect them to get money to money pay? From. So it's only, it's only fair for them to come to a round table and say, OK, this is what we are uh, accepting in the circumstance. I'll take you to Australia. The clubs in Australia, what they have done is they, are, they applied a statute, the Fair Work Act of 2009. That mm -hmm. Fair Work Act empowers the Australian clubs to temporarily suspend the employment agreements with all the players mm -hmm. until uh, everything returns to normal. So that is, that is a statutory power that they have invoked. So uh, nobody is challenging that one just yet, but mm. so it will be nice to see what happens in the coming days. Mm. So I would urge, I don't know what is happening in the NPFL. Uh, they had uh, a video conferencing about two days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been no communique, no policy statement from the LMC suggesting the way forward. Uh, I have it though from the grapevine that uh, most of the clubs right now are owing their players, <laughs> understandably so. But yeah. 
But then we need to have a statement from the LMC mm. that, okay, going forward, are they going to be uh, some kind of uh, reprieve from the LMC down to the club so that they will be able to perform their contractual obligations? Mm. So if you don't have these things put in, put in place, uh, it's going to be a recipe for disaster. And mm. we only pray that that doesn't get to uh, mm. that point. We only pray that that does not get to that point. A word from Steve Mwabwezi right there.